नमस्ते एंड गुड मॉर्निंग एवरीवन लेट्स स्टार्ट अवर ट्यूसडे क्लास द महाभारत क्लास विद सम प्रेयर्स ओम गुरु ब्रह्मा गुरु विष्णु गुरु देवो महेश्वर गुरु साक्षात पर ब्रह्म तस्मै श्री गुरुवे नमः ओम भू भव स्वाहा तत्सवित्र वरे नयम भर्गो देवस्य धीमहि दियो यो नह प्रचोदयात अस्तो मा सद्गम्य तम सोमा ज्योतिर्गम्य मृत्योर्मा अमृतम गम्य ओम सहनावत सहनाभुनक्त स वीर करवा वै तेजस्वी नवधी तमस्तु मा विद्वेशा वही ओम शांति 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 ओ लेट्स ओपन अवर महाभारत बुक्स ब्यूटिफुली ट्रांसलेटेड बाय मिस्टर मैनन वी आर ऑन पेज नंबर ट्वेंटी and this is a book number 2 so this there are two books so we are on book 2 and page number 20 the two armies that is the title of this chapter madri's brother and nakul and sahadev's uncle the mighty shalya heard that the pandavas exile was over he was thinking of visiting them in upallavya when yudhishthir's messenger arrived in his court <clears throat> so you remember madri was uh, pandu's second wife okay and then she was the mother of nakul and sahadev so this shalya is her brother my lord yudhishthir wants you to know there may be war between the pandavas and the kauravas he sends word to ask you to fight for him because both the kauravas and the pandavas they are trying to gather <coughs> the armies of those great kings so tell my nephews i will come at once to upapallavya shalya set out the next day with one akshani it was some way from his kingdom to the mutsya city and the going was hard duryodhan heard of shalya's march he decided he wanted to win the powerful kshatriya to his side and strike the first blow of the field of battle duryodhan arranged for luxurious camps for shalya's army along its tedious progress wine flowed the food was fit for kings the music was sweet and the dancing girls were seductive duryodhan even had his agents lead shalya some way from his true route and feasted him lavishly in mansions built with guru's lands the riyodhan's arrangements quite overwhelmed the shalya who thought yudhishthir was his host the riyodhan had instructed his men not to reveal for whom they worked one day in the fourth or fifth heaven shalya was awash on his secret host's hospitality particularly on the heady wine he said to the servants call your masters who serve my nephew yudhishthir i want to thank them a little puzzled the servants bowed and withdrew duryodhan himself was waiting in that mansion the servants came to him and told him what shalya said with a smile the kaurav walked into his unsuspecting guest's presence duryodhan bowed and said i hear you wanted to see me my lord duryodhan but i thought i'm pleased to be of service to such a great kshatriya shalya got up and embraced him you have looked after me and my men with unforgettable affection i must reward you ask me for anything and it shall be yours duryodhan knelt before shalya my lord i want just one boon from you that you fight a war for me having given his word shalya could hardly refuse i will fight my nephews for you duryodhan but i was on my way to meet you dhishtar you go back to hastinapur and i will come there after visiting pandu's sons you have my word duryodhan said i trust akshatriya will not forget his word no duryodhan my word is sacred i will fight on your side duryodhan embraced shalya then hurry to upalavya and meet your nephews so you can join me quickly in hastinapur and duryodhan was gone shalya was left wondering if he had not been more than a little rash under the influence of the excellent wine with which the corvus men had lied him he pushed the thought aside and gave orders for his army to match march within the hour to upalavya 
Shalya was quite sober when he arrived in that city. When he saw his nephews and they welcomed him so warmly, he regretted having agreed to fight for Duryodhan. He embraced each of them crying, my poor children, <clears throat> what an ordeal you have been through. I am so pleased it is over now and you are back among us. Draupadi, my child, how good to see you again and just as beautiful as you always were. When they sat together in the palace, Yudhishthira said, our trials are not yet over, uncle. It seems we must still have war with our cousins. He saw Shalya flush. Yudhishthir looked at him curiously. Shalya took a deep breath and said, Yudhishthir, I have promised to Duryodhan I will fight the war on his side. He told Yudhishthir how he had been enticed into making that promise. As he spoke, he saw Yudhishthir's eyes fill. When Shalya finished and lapsed into a sorry silence, the Pandav said gently, I understand how it happened, my lord. Duryodhan planned the whole thing, but it pains me that we will have to fight our own uncle in this terrible war. Red-faced Shalya mumbled, Yudhishthir, you know how much I love you, especially when I think of your exile. I could cut my tongue out for giving my word to Duryodhan, but having given it, I must keep it. Yudhishthir was thoughtful. Suddenly he said, I think I have a way in which we can turn the defeat into a victory. As a Kshatriya, you must not break the words you gave Duryodhan, but you must make me also a promise. I will do anything except break my word. It is not an honorable thing I'm going to ask you, but it is something that must be done. When I think of all the enemies arranged against us, I truly fear only one of them, Karan. Only he can kill Arjun. The rest are no match for my brother. Perhaps Karan is not his equal either, but my heart tells me to beware of him. Krishna will be Arjun's Sarthi during the war, and Karan will want a Sarthi who is as good as Krishna. We all know you are the finest Sarthi on earth, my lord. At some time, Duryodhan will ask you to drive Karan's chariot. I am certain Arjun and Karan will come face to face on the field. And the duel between them shall decide the outcome of the war. Dharam is with us, but somehow I fear that against Karan, Dharam alone won't suffice. What would you have me do? Now Yudhishthir spoke as if he was another man. He whispered, talk to Karan when he rides into battle. Dishearten him. Compare him to Arjun. Extol my brother to the sky and make Karan believe he is inferior to him. Fill his heart with doubt. Tell him a Sudhputra can never be an equal of a Kshatriya and a Devaputra. I know it is base, but I fear the earth shall be lost to us if Karan fights as he can. His, con his inconfidence is his only weakness. We must take advantage of it. A grim smile touched Shalya's face. Perhaps it was a God sent, after all, the rashness which made me commit myself to Duryodhana. It may be that I shall be a deadlier foe when I am near him. As you say, it is hardly what a Kshatriya should do. But when I think of the 13 years you spent in the wilderness and of Draupadi's shame, my blood cries out for revenge. Yes, at the critical time, I will whisper doubt and fear into current soul. I bless you, Panda. Victory shall be yours and you will rule the earth as you deserve to. More than a little ashamed, Yudhishthira said, of all of them, it is only Karan I fear. I am not sure why. It was as if some part of his mind murmured to him insistently that Karan was not what he seemed. Yudhishthira could never quieten the niggling fear he had of that warrior, not though Arjun had beaten him convincingly outside Virat. When it came to a duel to the death, Yudhishthira was afraid Karan would prove Invincible. Shalya left Upalavya and marched to Hastinapur with his legion. Duryodhan welcomed him like a brother. The first of Yudhishthira's allies to arrive in Upalavya was Satyaki with the, his one Akshani. Then Rishtaketu, king of the Shadis, came with another Akshani. Jarasan's son, Jaitsen, came from Maghad with a glittering legion and the five Kake brothers with theirs. Drupad arrived with his army with a brilliant Shikhandi, whose roots were deep and strange, the fire-born Drishtadyuman, and with the Drupadi's sons, the young tigers, 
chafing to prove themselves worthy of their father's empire. Virat brought one Akshoni as well from his capital and came to Uplavya with his sons and brothers and Utra Kumar, who was a celebrated Kshatriya now, the Pandya king and Neel, king of Mahishmati, came with their legions. Seven Oshnik Akshonis flowed across the earth, a tide of fighting men, and swarmed around Uplavya, and they were the Pandavs to command. But if immense legions came together at Uplavya, the legions that swelled the ranks of the Ryodhan's army in Hastinapur were vaster. Bhagdat was the first to answer the Korva's call, and he brought an Akshana. Then Shalya arrived with his army, as did Bhurishusa. Kritvarman came from Dwarka with the promised Yadav force. Jaydrath of Sindhu, Sudakshina of Kamboj, Vind and Anuvind of Avanti all brought an Akshani each, and there was a host of other lesser kings of the earth loyal to Duryodhana who answered his summons to war, and their combined forces amounted to another three Akshanis. The Pandav's army numbered seven Akshani, and Dhritarashtra's sons had eleven to call his own. Duryodhan kept his legions on the banks of the Ganga and employed another army of servants to cater to the soldiers every need. The Kaura was lord of the earth. After the years of the Pandav's exile, his coffers overflowed with their wealth and his own. Duryodhan's army camped outside Hastinapur was well cared for. Next chapter, the messengers. Meanwhile, the Brahman from Drupad's court arrived in Hastinapur and was shown into Dhritarashtra's palace. He was an imposing figure with clear sage eyes. When Bhishma Dhritarashtra and Vidur heard the Pandavas had sent him, they received him with honor. When the Brahman's comfort had been seen to, the blind king called a council to hear what he had come to say. When all the royal and powerful in Hastrapur filled the Kuru Sabha, Dhritarashtra said, the Pandavas have sent this good Brahman from Drupad's court as their emissary. Let us hear what he has to say. The Brahman had been well looked after and perhaps they hoped to hear words of conciliation from him. He rose and a bright and imposing figure he was, that old man, he began. This is an ancient house in which I am honored to speak today. My Lord, yours is a noble line and all your ancestors who sat before you on the Kuru throne were men of Dharam, which is why the house of Kuru has lasted so long upon the face of the earth and its glory did not diminish. The Brahman looked around him leisurely. He was at his ease. Yes, this is an august sabha into which I'm privileged to bear my message. You all knew, you all know far better than I, the dharam that a kshatriya is sworn to. Dhritarashtra and Pandu are sons of the same father. No one doubts that. The world knows that Pandu conquered most of the present Kuru kingdom. Thus that kingdom belongs equally to the sons of Dhritarashtra and the sons of Pandu. The Brahman lowered his voice to make his point better. The sons of Dhritarashtra have a kingdom to rule today. Why is it the sons of Pandu do not? The kingdom you bequeathed them, Dhritarashtra, the wilderness that flowered when Yudhishthir sat on his throne in Indraprastha. In this house of Dharam, time and again, Dhritarashtra's sons have tried to be rid of their cousins, even to kill them. Force was of no avail and Duryodhan and his uncle Shakni resorted to deceit. They took Yudhishthir's kingdom from him at a game of dice. The world knows that Shakuni is not only a master player, but also a master of cheating. It was not as if the elders of this sabha did not know Shakuni was using loaded dice when he played Yudhishthir. Yet the crew elders sat and watched as Shakuni took everything Yudhishthir owned from him. Was this the dharam of one of the noblest houses on earth? Was this how Pandu's sons should have been treated in Pandu's brother's court? He paused and a hush had fallen on the council in Hastinapur. From the Brahman stone, it was abundantly clear the Pandavas were not offering any compromises. But the Pandavas do not want revenge for all they have suffered. They only want back what is theirs by right. 
they want half the kuru kingdom which dhritarashtra himself once gave them i have come here to ask the kuru elders to give back what belongs to yudhishthira what was to be returned to him once his exile had been served yudhishthira is a man of peace he does not want a war in which kshatriya kind itself will be destroyed but if his kingdom is not returned honorably he will have no choice left except to fight let this august sabha know that the sons of pandu are far from helpless seven akshanis have gathered at uplavya if duryodhan does not put his greed behind him and relent there will be war like the world has never seen kshatriya blood will fall upon the earth like crimson rain when satyaki bhim nakul sahdev and yudhishthir take arms against you how will you resist them when indra's son arjun with krishna as his sarthi blows at you like a gale of death how will you contain him o bhishma dhritarashtra vidur you are all wise and experienced men kuru elders i have come to ask you to persuade duryodhan to relent do as i ask i beg you or the house of kuru will be destroyed and with it the very ways of things having delivered his message the brahman sat down bhishma responded to him i am pleased to hear the pandavas are well that krishna is with them and they have no wish to leave the path of dharma though they have an army of seven akshanis yet you bring a hearty message from my grandsons brahman and your tongue is sharp however what you have said is not false and i honor your words it is true the pandavas have suffered as kings of the earth hardly do they and their queen were forced to live like hermits in the prime of their lives it is true that they too have an equal right to this kingdom of their fathers and it also true there is no kshatriya in the world like arjun and any army will find it hard to contain him yes all of us here know these things well bhishma had not finished when karan jumped up and cried is there no end to this we hear the same things repeated in the sabha brahman you have said nothing new or very wise yes we all know yudhishthir lost lost a game of dice to shakuni and he gambled away everything he owned including his freedom we knew that without your telling us messenger <clears throat> but now yudhishthir dares send you here to threaten the kuru sovereign because he has drupad's sport and old virats has yudhishthir lost his wits in the forest that he thinks can threaten duryodhan listen to me brahman duryodhan will not give you dishter a foot of land out of fear but if it is for dharma he will give away his entire kingdom have the pandavas forgotten the real conditions of their exile that if any of them was seen during the agyat was they would all go back to the forest for another 12 years yudhishthir himself agreed to this condition all of us here why the kuru army saw arjun in the matsya kingdom dharma demands the pandavas live in the jungle for another 12 years but the noble duryodhan does not insist they do he is prepared to receive them here and have them live among us as his cousins and dependents it is not duryodhan but yudhishthir who must leave the path he treads which leads straight to disaster duryodhan smiled to hear his fierce loyal karana the korva nodded to agree with what his friend said and in appreciation of the manner in which he chose to say it bishm was outraged enough i have heard enough of your brashness in this court karan you speak too loudly for one who fled the field when you faced arjun in battle six renowned warriors from this sabha i among them could not contain arjun though he fought alone with just a boy for his sarthi can you imagine what a force he will be with krishna at his chariot head just as surely as karan ran for his life a few days ago duryodhan and all of us will die if we are foolish enough to fight a war against the pandavas it is not only that they are greater kshatriyas than we are and bhim and arjun are a match for 10 duryodhans and karans <coughs> no <coughs> eternal dharan is on their side and krishna is arjun sarthi many of you may be too young to realize what this means but i have no doubt in my mind that if we don't give back what is theirs to the sons of pandu we will lose everything our lives as well doom is what awaits us and all kshatriya kind if we don't stop this 
Kareen into madness on which Duryodhan leads us. Shaking, livid at Karan, Bhishma sat down. Now Dhritarashtra said, I agree with Pita Maha Bhishma. He speaks for the good of both the Kauravs and the Pandavas and from his love for us all. When this good Brahman brings a message of peace, Karan, how dare you speak arrogantly to him? We must not have this war at any cost or there will be bloodshed as not the eldest among us can imagine. Brahman, go back to my brother's sons. Tell them I will consider every aspect of this grave and perilous circumstance in which we find ourselves. And I will send Sanjay shortly to Upalavya to tell Yudhishthir what we have decided. I must sit in careful consultation with my Sabha before we arrive at a conclusion. Tell my son Yudhishthir he will hear from me soon. And I thank you, good Brahman, for coming here on the mission of peace. The Brahman bowed and went back to Uplavya, where he conveyed all that he had transpired in the Kuru Sabha to Yudhishthir and his brothers, to Krishan and Drupad, and the Pandavas, other allies. Now began the anxious wait for Sanjay. In Hastinapur, the king called for Sanjay. This courtier, who was also the king's society, was one of the few men alive with whom Dhritarashtra shared any of his true feelings. Since he heard how Arjun routed the Kurus in the Matsya kingdom, Dhritarashtra had been terrified. Now he said to Sanjay, old friend, go as my ambassador to the Pandavas. Say I asked after their well-being, not only now, but also through their 13 years of exile. Tell them I was never their enemy and I am pleased their ordeal is over. I have watched Yudhishthir since the day he first came to Hastinapur when he was just a boy. I have never known a character so lofty and pure. I doubt the earth has been many men to equal him in all her ages. Sanjay thought his king was on the point of breaking down and crying. Dhritarashtra said, they are true and honorable, Sanjay. My nephews are blameless. They walk the way of dharam. Who can hate them except my envious Duryodhan and that wild and thoughtless Karan of his? The world loves the sons of Pandu. All the Kurus love you, Krishna. The king trembled. Sanjay, I am alone and afraid. How can my son think he can rob the Pandavas of their kingdom? But alas, he will not listen to anyone. The king struggled against a darkness that engulfed him, choking his life. Duryodhan is so foolish, he does not see beyond his own vanity or realize with whom he is dealing. They are not just his cousins, they are Dev Putras. Why, if he wanted to, Arjun could burn up the earth with his Gandhi? But Duryodhan does not understand this. Bhim could scatter the crew army as the wind does a pile of grass. Nakul and Sahadev are hardly less than Arjun. They will hunt our men like eagles do sparrows. Another thought struck the king and he groaned. Sanjay, with Krishna on their side, what army of heaven and earth can withstand the Pandavas? Doesn't Duryodhan know who Krishna is? That he dares to fight against him? Ah, my son's heart is as blind as his father's eyes are. Duryodhan thinks he has 11 Akshani against the pond of seven. His friend Karan assures him that greater numbers will win the war. But I know better and Bhishma and Drone know better. Go to Yudhishthir, my good Sanjay, and tell him his uncle wants peace. Tell Krishna also that Dhritarashtra sues abjectly for peace. Tell Krishna to ask Yudhishthir to accept the peace I offer him. Yudhishthir will always listen to what he says. Old friends, this is the most critical mission of your life. God, go with you. And the king gave Sanjay a message to take to his nephews. Sanjay arrived in Upalavya and Yudhishthir received him affectionately. When all the kings gathered in the sabha of that city to hear the message Sanjay brought from Dhritarashtra, Yudhishthir said, what news of our elders in Hastanapur, Sanjay? Does our uncle remember us and our Pitama? Do our cousins think kindly of us, Sanjay? Do you bring good news? Sanjay said solemnly, in Hastanapur, they do all surely remember you, Yudhishthira. My Lord Dhritarashtra asks kindly after your welfare, your brothers and your wives. Your virtue has not been forgotten or Arjun's prowess and Bhim's strength. Nakul and Sahadev are no, not forgotten either or their valor. Yudhishthira said, does Duryodhan remember Chitrasen and how my brother Arjun rescued him from the Gandhara? 
Then suddenly his eyes were moist. But Sanjay, I know that one good turn is hardly enough to achieve love between our cousins and ourselves. My friend, what effort have I spared to make peace with Duryodhan? How easy it would have been for me to attack Hastinapur long ago or to allow Chitrasen to kill my cousin. Alas, Duryodhan will not think of it like that. He is so deranged with greed and envy. Sanjay said, my lord, in the court of Hastinapur, there are both good and evil men who surround Duryodhan. And he is our virtual king after the Vaishnav Yajna. But Dhritarashtra would be a fool if he were against you. He grieves for you and he has not forgotten your strength. During all the years of your exile, unknown to you, Dhritarashtra asked constantly after your whereabouts and your well-being. He grieved deeply over what happened. None of us can say what the future holds. Who would have thought the great Yudhishthir who performed the Raj Suya Yag would spend 13 years in the forest like a Rishi. Dhritarashtra says you are a man of perfect dharma. He depends on you to find a solution to the crisis between yourself and your cousins. He prays there will be no war between the sons of Dhritarashtra and the sons of Pandu. The king has conferred with his sabha and he sent you this message through me. Shall I repeat the words of my king? Yudhishthir asked him to in that crowded court. Sanjay began, I, Dhritarashtra, king of the Kurus, send my greetings to my sons, Yudhishthir, Bhim, Arjun, Nakul, and Sadhya. I greet my dear Krishan, Satyaki, Chekitan, Virat, and Drupad. I hope that Drishdhaman and Draupadi will also hear a message I send to Sanjay. All those addressed were present and many more besides. Sanjay went on, I have known you since you were a boy, Yudhishthir, and I know you will never walk the way of evil. You are the most honest and steadfast man on earth. And you are born into a great house. You know that the noblest thing a man can do is to give up his life for the sake of his kin. Yudhishthir, I implore you, abandon the shameful thought that has entered your heart of having war with your cousins. If you spill the blood that unites you, that sin will ruin your taintless dharam forever. It will be a stain upon your character that can never be erased. Yudhishthir, it seems you have decided to destroy the very world as we know it. What matter then who wins or loses the war you want to fight? I concede that you, your brothers and your allies might well prove stronger than my sons. Even if you succeed, how will you ever have peace of mind after killing your cousins? Just think, my child, however powerful the Kshatriya you have with you maybe, the Kuru army is not a force you can trifle with. Bhisham, Dron, Krip, Ashwatthama, Karan and host of others who are like guards upon the earth will face you in battle. Blood will flow as we have not dreamt. Yudhishthir, by your dharam, isn't that a sin? What good can come of this dreadful war? Win or lose, it will be the same. There are no victors in such a war, only the vanquished and the dead. The Pandavas have been righteous all these years. They have walked the path of truth unflinchingly. You must not ruin your fame with such a terrible crime. O Krishna, O Drupad, I pray you listen to me and advise Yudhishthir against the calamity he is plotting. I speak not just for the good of the house of Guru, but of Kshatriya kind. Why of the very earth? Bhishma and I both beg you, think only of peace. Surprisingly, now Yudhishthir lost his composure. He cried, this is intolerable. My uncle is accusing me of wanting this war, of the enormous sin of wishing millions dead. Why does he speak as if I need to be persuaded to peace? Our messenger came to Hastinapur to offer peace. If I wanted war, I could have waged it 13 years ago. The sons of Kunti have always walked the way of Dharam and the world knows it. Why does Dhritarashtra accuse me of being a warmonger? When it is to his own son he should look for the cause of the war that will be. Duryodhan's heart is a dark fire. Feed a fire and it wants more and more fuel. Perhaps my mistake was to feed it in the first place with our exile. Now he wants more because his greed is insatiable. He wants everything, all that is ours as well. As for my uncle, he is not innocent. Didn't he stand 
with his son when the Pandavas were, were exiled? Did he raise his voice to stop the shame Panjali suffered in his sabha? Did Bhishma, for that matter? No, Dhritarashtra does not care for me or mine, but now he is afraid. He sent us to Varanvrat and then gave us a wilderness in Khandavprasth to be our patrimony. He is as guilty as the real one. None of them had seen Yudhishthir like this before. Bhim and Draupadi had feared he might accept any beggarly terms Dhritarashtra offered, but they saw another Yudhishthir today. This was no longer the infinitely patient Yudhishthir of their exile, and he had not finished what he had to say. Our uncle Vidur was the only one who told Duryodhan the truth, that he was wrong. Vidur was the only friend we had, and the Korvas had. Even on the day of the dice, the most evil day of my life, Vidur warned them of the consequences of what Duryodhan was doing. Did Dhritarashtra listen to him then? Did Dron or Bhishan? When it comes to his son, Dhritarashtra is blind in not only his eyes, but also his spirit. No price is too high for him to pay to secure whatever Duryodhan wants, even if it is the suffering or the kingdom of his brother's sons. And Duryodhan has no thought for dharam. He is wanton and selfish, and his tongue is as vicious as his heart is evil. Does he give the elders of the most ancient sabha on earth the respect they deserve? No, he merely uses them for his convenience, and Dhritarashtra encourages them. On the day of the dice, we heard Vidur beg Dhritarashtra to stop the game, but the king only asked, who won? I will never forget that. I saw the excitement on his face. For once, he did not bother to hide his feelings behind his blind man's mask. At every throw, he cried, who won? And I thought, who is more anxious to have my kingdom, the son or the father? At least Duryodhan does not disguise his hatred for us with pretenses or sweet words. With him, we know where we stand. But my uncle, whom we revered like our own father, his heart is darker than his son's. Yet he is a coward and dare not show what he feels. Ah, this king is more devious than Shakuni. He is trying to say I am the one who wants war and he is for peace. On the day of the gambling, when I saw how Dhritarashtra refused to listen to what Vidur was saying, I knew the end of the house of Guru was at hand. His voice full of sorrow, Yudhishthir said, Who are the lawmakers in Hastanapur today? Who are they who wield influence, Sanjay? Are they men of dharam or are they the opposite, greedy, villainish men? Duryodhan is the real king in Hastanapur and we know what he is. Naturally, only those who are close to Duryodhan have real power in his city. And who are those? Shakuni, Dushashan and the Sutputra Karan. It is not hard to imagine the nature of the kingship and the course it is set on. Sanjay, Yudhishthir may be a man of dharam. He may follow the path of truth to the point where he appears foolish, but Yudhishthir is not entirely a fool. Even before you complete the message he sends, I know what Dhritarashtra wants. He wants to keep the whole kingdom. I say to you, good messenger, go back to Hastanapur and tell your king that Yudhishthir does not want war. But if he isn't given back what is his by right, half the crew kingdom, there will be war between the Pandavas and the Kauravs. Sanjay said quickly, my lord, you haven't heard all of the message I bring. The king says to you, man's life is brief, you mister. Why let it end in shame? Why allow yourself to be remembered as the Kuru who split the blood of his own kinsmen? Don't lead your life into this war. There will be, that will be the end of you, regardless of whether you win or lose. I fear the Kauravs will not give up their kingdom now. They have ruled it for 13 years in your absence. What does an earthly kingdom count for anyway? Yudhishthir, for a man of dharam like you, it would be better to live on the kindness of the Vrishnis and Andhaksa than fight this war against your own blood. The first course would establish you as the noblest man who ever lived and assure you immortal fame. Yes, this human life is a short one and full of sin, suffering and sorrow. Dharam is more important than wealth or possessions. Only honor is permanent in this unstable world. 
the desire for material possessions is what steals a man's judgment from him. A man like you, a seeker after truth, should burn every vestige of desire from his heart. The longing for wealth and the power is a shackle on the spirit, an obstacle on the path to salvation. Few men can renounce it. You are one of the few, Yudhishtha, Prince of the Dharam. I have heard about all the time you spent in the company of the rishis of the forest. Have you learned something from them, nephew? Haven't you learned, as I can tell you, being an old man today, that wealth counts for nothing in life? It is only a burden to the soul. Honor and freedom mean everything. Be free of the desire for kingdom and wealth. Yudhishthya, think of dharam, which is wealth in the next world. Even if you do win the terrible war you plan, what will you achieve? You will have to atone for the sin of having killed your kinsmen. Guilt is all you will gain for yourself. How will you enjoy a kingdom, one of spilling your cousin's blood? I say to you again, as one who has lived longer than you have, life is shorter than you think. It is full of grief and sickness, and it ends quickly in death. You may win back your kingdom. You may perform the Ashwamed and the Rajsuya Yagyas. But when you die, and that will be all too soon, my son, this dark deed of yours will cover your glory with shame and sin. Thirteen years ago, you suffered what you now perceive as an injustice. Why didn't you fight my sons then? Krishan, Balram, Drupad, and Kakes, and Satyaki were all with you. Your friends and your brothers begged you to declare war, but you would not. You were stubborn and steadfast. Now suddenly, after 13 years, you decide to fight. Why, Yudhishthya? You have been patient for so long. If you continue to be patient until you die, the world will remember you as a saint. Anger is a demon that cripples the mind. Munis say that a man who swallows his anger comes to peace. What will you get? Even if you can kill Bhishma, Dron, Kripa, Shalya, Duryodhan, his brothers, and Karan, what will your final reward be? This vast earth bounded by the sea, but you will not escape old age and death. Once you have actually killed those you now set out to kill, you will mourn them. You will bitterly regret what you have done. Heed what I say, Yudhishthir, my son. One must never betray one's own nature. I know your nature. You are a gentleman. My last word to you is give up your anger. Forget everything that happened. Return to the forest. Spend the rest of your life in quest of nirvan and win undying fame and joy for yourself. Or else live with Krishna in Dwarka. Live off the arms of the Vrishnas. They will see to you your every need and comfort. We have walked the high road of dharam for so long. Why leave it now for the alleyways of sin? I beg you, forget the bloodshed you are planning. Live in peace. So said my king Dhritarashtra to you, said Sanjay in Upalavya. Having delivered his message in full, he sat down and was silent, waiting for the distress response. Next chapter is Pandav's reply. At first, Dhritarashtra's message stunned the Sabha of Kings in Upalavya, and no one spoke. For a moment, it even seemed the Pandavs were the ones who wanted war and a festival of bloodshed, while the blind king in Hastanapur and his sons were men of Dharam, praying for peace. Then the cold evil of the old whole king struck that cold. Bhim jumped up and his eyes turning crimson, began to pace the floor like a great tiger, growling from time to time. Sadev's face was dark, his chest heaved as if his rage would erupt from him in fire. Arjun, his mouth a grim lion, glanced at Krishna. Krishna read his impulse clearly to stop this negotiation with evil, to write to Hastnapa and burn its malignant thing. Drupad sat stricken, hardly able to believe what he heard. Draupadi trembled where she sat. For a moment, perfect silence held the Sabha. Yudhishthir also was too shocked to speak. He had not dreamt his uncle would go to this insane extent. The Pandav's mind flashed back to all the years when he had obeyed. Dhritarashtra in his plea. Loved him like a father, trusted him absolutely. Coldness gripped his heart. He felt invisible hands were 
strangling him. Then he realized that his brothers and all the kings were waiting for him to answer Dhritarashtra. Panic swept over Pandu's son, for the thing that held him in a vice would not allow him to breathe, let alone speak. At that moment, he turned to Krishna. In the dark one's eyes, he saw complete understanding of what he felt, and a wave of relief flooded him. At Krishna's look, the evil that seized Yudhishthir faltered and released him. His heart still pounding, but fury driving fear from his body, the Panda found the courage to speak. In a steady voice, he said war warningly, Sanjay, you are only a messenger, so I will not show you my anger. But from now, be careful what you say in the Sabha. Don't forget I am not a Brahman, but a Kshatriya. Perhaps Dhritarashtra believes some of what he accuses me of before all these, my dearest ones on earth, it is not my place to answer an elder in an open sabha. It is his privilege to believe whatever he wants. And my dharam is to keep what I think to myself. As for the reply, which my uncle obviously expects from me, I leave that to Christian. He has heard everything you said. Let him decide if we should desist from war because of the message that Rashtra sends. His voice sank, or whether we should have war just because of his message. Whatever I have done so far has been with Krishna's blessings. Today I relinquish my will and my future to him. Let him decide what we must do. I will abide by his decision. Only the dark one saw in his clear heart how more subtle pieces of fate fell in place for a bloody war. He had come to remove a burden of evil from the earth and his brilliant life had not been a peaceful one. But this final war between the forces of darkness and light would be an unprecedented purification. The war on the brink of the ages would shed more blood than any previous one, and the grateful earth would be lighter by millions of arrogant lives. Then she could cross easily into the age to come, the diminished Kali Yuga, with no power left upon her that might dominate the coming night. The true reasons for Krishna's birth into the world at the age's end were as mysterious as life itself, as inscrutable as he was. But he had come to cleanse the earth and the Kuruvar was to be the climax of that ceremony. Knowing how inexorable destiny is, Krishna smiled to himself at these courtly messages and deliberations. But in the council in Upalavya, he said, Sanjay, I am moved that my cousin relinquishes his very fate to me, the welfare of the Pandavas, is my first concern. Yet I would also like Dhritarashtra's son to have long lives. Your king's message is strange indeed. It seems to me he seeks to blame Yudhishthir for Duryodhan's crimes. After the game of the dice, we all urged Yudhishthir to take back with force what he had been deprived of by low deceit. But he said he was also to blame for what, he, what had happened. And the path of dharam led surely through 13 years of exile. Now the blind one in Hastinapur dares to fault him for his rectitude, for his majestic patience. Sanjay, a thief, must be punished. Even a king who takes what is not his is just a thief. To my mind, Yudhishthira should punish Duryodhan. It is his kshatriya. There will be no peace as long as Duryodhan holds what rightfully belongs to Yudhishthira. I say not only is Duryodhan a thief, but his father Dhritarashtra is also one. Didn't he encourage his son to take what did not belong to him? Didn't he enjoy the fruits of Duryodhan's sin? Even now Dhritarashtra does not want to give back what is not his to keep. What he gave away long ago, though it was only a desert then, and Dhritarashtra dares preach peace to Yudhishthira who is an image of dharam on earth. I would laugh at his temerity, were it not so heartless and so tragic. I still say to you, Yudhishthir does not want this war, and neither do I. We do not wish to stain the earth with the blood of 11 Akshanis or even to kill Dhritarashtra's sons. Let them return in their trust to Yudhishthir, and there will be no war. Only Yudhishthir's selfless nature makes this solution possible. A lesser man would have extracted terrible revenge for the shame. He and his brothers and the most of all Draupadi suffered in Hastanapur. 
and for 13 bitter years of exile. Can the Ryodhan even imagine what these lords of the earth endured when they were deprived in a day of everything they had? <clears throat> this was not the genial Krishna, whom everyone knew and loved. It was another Krishna, grave and fearsome. He spoke softly, slowly, and there was no laughter in him at all. Yes, return to your king and tell him what I say to you now. Tell every man in that Sabha Krishna said each one of them deserves to die for what they did to Panchali on the day of the game of dice. I accept no one, not the elders who sat by and watched what happened without stirring to stop it. All of them, save Vidur, deserve to die. Sanjay tell Karan that Arjun has never forgotten what he said to Draupadi on that day. Tell him my cousin does not sleep at nights because he hears those words murmuring in his head relentlessly. Tell Dushashan Bhim has not forgotten what he tried to do to the precious Panjali. Remind him of Bhim's oath. Tell Dushashan that Draupadi has not yet tied her hair. She's waiting to wash it in his blood before she does. Tell Duryodhan that awake and asleep Bhim sees the thigh on which he dare tell Panjali to sit. Ah, Sanjay, you know everything that happened. I am surprised that you bring this message to us from your king. Go back and tell them. Sahadev has not forgotten the oath he swore to kill Shakuni. Every day he thinks of the smile on Shakuni's face when he told Yudhishthira across the dice board, you still have Draupadi to wager. Every morning at his prayers, Nakul renews his oath to kill Ullak. Ullak is a son of Shakuni. If you don't know. I need say no more. Dhritarashtra has not sent you here because he truly wants peace or to give up his greed, but only because he's afraid. We want peace not because we are afraid, but because we do not want to seek Kshatriya kind destroyed by the war. Because Yudhishthira still cares for the lives, not only of his brothers, but of his cousins. That is a great difference, Sanjay. I know Yudhishthira, he does not want to make widows of the Korva's wives but the Ryodhan is full of darkness and obstinacy. Go back to your king and say all this to him. Say, I will come myself to Hastinapur soon to try to make them see reason. I do not think I will succeed, but I will surely come and try. In the meanwhile, tell Dhritarashtra he did not choose his words wisely when he sent his message through you. He does Yudhishthira an injustice. And if the Ryodhan does not relent, this foolish message will be answered with arrows. There are two trees in this generation of the Kuru house. One is a sinister tree that grows in Hastanapur, a tree of evil. Its name is Duryodhan. Its trunk is Karan, its branches are Shakni, its flower is Dushashan, and its deep roots from where it truly springs is your blind king with his secretive heart, cowardly, dangerous, cold-blooded Dhritarashtra. Look here at the other core of tree, fear and lustrous, a tree of dharam and wisdom called Yudhishthira. Arjun is its trunk, Bhim is its branches, Nakul and Sahadev are its fruit and flowers. Krishna smiled suddenly, and I am the root of this tree of light. A storm will sweep the earth, a savage storm of war. Think carefully, Sanjay, which of these trees shall withstand that storm? Go now. You have reply enough from us to take back to your king. Tell him everything we said to you. Say the Pandavas wish fervently for peace, and peace there will be if Yudhishthira's kingdom is returned to him. Otherwise, there will be war, and the war will be the end of the Karvas. Sanjay said sadly, Yudhishthira, the message I brought was not my own, nor does it express what I feel. I am only my king's voice. When I come as his messenger, I have known you and your brothers since you were boys, and you know how fond I am of you. You must not think harshly of me, and you must not either, Krishna. I have always wished the sons of Pandu well, and I still do. Now give me a message for the king. Yudhishthira had regained his composure. Gently he said, I did not mean to hurt you, Sanjay, but I was stung by my uncle's message. You have always loved us as much as Vidur has, and I am aware of it. You were there on the day of the game of the dice, and I know you warned the king against what he did. Good Sanjay, a golden bowl does not change to a base metal because poison is poured into it. As for the message I sent back through you, wish them all well in Hastinapur. Greet the elders for me and the others. Then tell Duryodhan I said to him, 
cousin, the only music in your heart is of your desires. Sometimes you must listen to other sweeter songs. We want peace with you, Duryodhan. You are a great king. Give back what is mine and be a greater king than ever. Either return in the trust or fight me. I pray you will listen to reason and there may be a lasting peace between us. Give this message to my cousin Sanjay. Arjun did not like the softness of his brother's message. He rose and said in anger, Indraprast is like a bond woman to Duryodhan, while Yudhishthir is her true master. Tell Duryodhan to release our city and our kingdom, or he will face the Pandits in battle. We have Krishna, Satya, Kidrupa, Drishtaman, and Shikhandi with us. Duryodhan made my brother sleep on a rough bed for 12 years. In return, we will make him sleep forever on a bloody field. Yudhishthir has kept his anger to himself. These long, hard years, if he unleashes it, his rage will consume Duryodhan and his army as fire does a dry forest in summer. Yam wields a mace. Duryodhan will see him wield his mace among the core of host. And I swear my brother's wrath shall not be less than death's. Let Duryodhan remember the other sons of Pandu. Let him think of Abhimanyu, who is Arjun's son and Krishna's nephew. Let him think well how he will stop my boy on the field of war. Abhimanyu will blow like a tempest at the corners. It was rare indeed for the quiet Arjun to say so much. Obviously, he was moved and they all listened to him in silence because he was eloquent today. Remind Duryodhan we have the indomitable Drupad and Virat with us. Surely he has not forgotten Shikhandi and Drishtiman. Tell your king the fireborn Drishtiman shall be the Senapati of our legions. Tell Duryodhan again that Satyaki is with us. I am certain he has forgotten Satyaki's valor, or he would not even dream of power. More than any of these, remind my foolish cousin that Krishna will be my Sarthi. Tell him, Sanjay, that the Pandavas plan a yadhya. Krishna will be the priest for our sacrifice. The song of the Gandhiv will be the sound of the Vedas, and the Havis, the burnt offering, will be the core of host. Take my message back to our cousin. Arjun sat down red-eyed, and Bhim, who stood some way off at the back of the court, cried, Tell that fool what Arjun says. Say, Bhim says the same thing. When the Sabha was quiet again, Yudhishthir said, Sanjay, you see how angry my brothers are. You must persuade Duryodhan to give me back my kingdom. I have no wish to be the occasion for this war. If everything else fails, I will accept just five towns to make peace. Let him give me Indraprastha. Virikprast, Jiant, and Varanprast. These hold memories for us. The fifth town, why, let it be a village, can be of his choice. Bhim and Arjun exchanged a glance at this madness and Krishna smiled. Yudhishthir went on. This is my offer to show Duryodhan. I do not want war. Let him give me these five towns and I will be content. How can I want my cousin's dead? No, I want peace. Sanjay bowed. He left the court in Uplavya with tears in his eyes that Yudhishthir should suffer as he did. Anxiety went with that good messenger as he rode back to Hastanapur. We'll start with the next chapter, The Blind King's Terror, next week. Om Purnamada Purnamidam Purnat Purnamudachyate Purnasya Purnamadaya Purnameva Visheshyate Om Shanti 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 Thank you very much.